everybody. Again, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, my name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership of the National Space Society. And along with Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, we'd like to welcome you to our Space Forum this evening. Uh, it's Space Settlement Perspectives with uh, Jim Crisofoli and Jim Plaxico. I think you're going to find this quite interesting. Two different perspectives on space settlement one about a global alliance and dealing with the issues of space settlement, and then an inside look at a design competition for a Mars city-state that would hold 1 million people. So uh, I think you're gonna find it very interesting. So we look forward to a, a good session. Uh, again, this is our continuing effort to provide some programming to you, the members. We are now on an every two week schedule. So our next event will be two weeks from this evening. And I'll talk about that uh, toward the end of the session. I always like to remind you of some space form etiquette. Now to submit a question, use the Q&A function. It's much better for us because that way the questions go right to the panelists. If you put the question in the chat, it can be lost with all the other things that are in there. Uh, comments and you know websites and things like that. So it's much better to put it into the Q&A function. And those questions are only seen by the panelists. If you do want to comment, use the chat function. Now the chat function is, can be seen by everybody. So obviously be respectful of the panelists and the audience. It's also best to view the session in speaker mode. So that way you highlight highlights the person who is actually speaking at the time. We're going to have two separate presentations this evening. What we've decided to do is have both presentations, then we'll go to Q&A. So if you have questions along the way, might be best to put them in right then and there, and we'll get them in order as they come in. So we do have some questions that were submitted prior. We'll try to get to some of those as well, but we think we'll have enough time to, to get to most of your questions. So it's now my pleasure to talk uh, and to get ready to introduce our speakers. Uh, we'll do that. We'll go into the presentations. We'll have Q&A. Uh, then we'll talk about the upcoming events, a few final NSS announcements, and then we'll wish everyone a good evening or a good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. So the program is tonight is we have two great speakers, Jim Crisofoli, the executive director of Galex, and he's gonna to talk to you more about that. He's also the director of the Hawaii Space Industry Innovation Program. And Jim Plaxico, you know Jim well, he's been a presenter and a moderator on some of these space forums previously, a president of the Chicago Society for Space Studies and also an NSS space ambassador. So I think you're going to enjoy this. I'm going to now turn it over to Jim, who's going to be talking about the Global Alliance for International Collaboration in Space. So I will stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Okay, Jim, it is all yours. Okay. Aloha. Can everyone hear me? We hear you. Okay, outstanding. Well, again, aloha and uh, very warm, and I emphasize warm greetings from the islands of Aloha. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be able to participate in this visionary NSS sponsored webinar. And I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce your participants to a new space initiative inspired by several uh, visionary space professionals worldwide that I truly believe has the potential of promoting public private partnerships and international alliances in space enterprise that ultimately could sustainably expand and diversify humankind's reach for the stars. Humanity is now embarking on a new era of space enterprise. Public and private research institutions worldwide are exploring innovative approaches to space science, exploration and development. Spacefaring nations building upon these innovations are working to expand and diversify both robotic and human space ventures. Non-spacefaring countries will also benefit from the pioneering technologies emerging through this space revolution, which ultimately could provide pathways to engage all of humanity on the frontiers of space. And opportunities are being explored now to apply space technologies and resources in ways that ultimately could improve and help sustain 
the high qualities of life on earth. Recognizing this potential and the benefits that could uh, redound to all of humankind, a global team of visionary space professionals, both public and private, is now exploring creative and diverse ways to help engage government agencies, universities, scientific institutions, commercial space ventures, and international organizations worldwide in an alliance that can both promote and expand collaboration in space enterprise, and in ways that can ultimately help reduce the costs, enhance the benefits, and hopefully accelerate timetables for future space missions. Known as the Global Alliance for International Collaboration in Space, or GALIX, this movement will formally be launched through a worldwide cyber Congress next month, specifically on March 18 and 19, and will be coordinated through our Hawaii Space Industry Innovation Program, or HiSpace. The initial GALIX concept to establish a global alliance of space-related organizations worldwide to help promote and enable international collaboration on a broad range of space ventures, both robotic and human, was actually launched back in 2016 with a presentation to the UN COPUS Technical Subcommittee under the banner of an international lunar decade, which was envisioned to run from 2020 to 2030. The goal was to help advance space science and exploration in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, and we definitely had Buzz Aldrin engage with that. Although this initiative uh, as such was never formally launched, the seeds were planted, and this concept has morphed into a global space alliance, promoting cooperative arrangements with various space programs and organizations worldwide. Now formally known as the Global Alliance for International Collaboration in Space, or GALIX, this initiative seeks to engage both spacefaring nations and their space agencies and multinational space organizations, entrepreneurial and private space enterprise, educational institutions, and not-for-profit organizations worldwide. It's also reaching out to non-spacefaring nations, as well as members of the International Astronautical Federation, participants in Coast Bar, and other groups referenced in the original Galix proposal to the UN COPUS Technical Subcommittee. Galix is seeking to both inspire and enable innovative approaches to space enterprise, exploring new models of finance and regulatory oversight, enhanced space safety and technical standards, and creative protocols for space missions. It's also exploring multiple opportunities to expand and diversify scientific and technology, uh, technology education and research, as well as to promote a vibrant space economy that could enrich and help sustain terrestrial civilizations, as well as enable off-world settlements. And enhanced scientific knowledge derived through space enterprise will also help sustain as well as improve the qualities of life on Earth while simultaneously advancing missions, both robotic and human, to the moon, cislunar space, and throughout our solar system. The operational focus and goals of uh, Galix and its affiliates include what will not be limited to promoting scientific research and commercial development of innovative space manufacturing and material processing capabilities with the goal of increasing the productivity and sustainability of space missions, enhancing both operational performance and safety, supporting technical innovations to help reduce the complexities and operational costs of space transportation, energy, robotics, information technology, and communication systems, development of new cooperative financing for space enterprise, including diverse partnerships that leverage both public and private investments to enable projects with long-term planning horizons. Enhanced understanding of potential um, cosmic hazards to Earth, as well as the development of new strategies and technologies <laughs> to both enable <clears throat> uh, planetary defense and help advance space research related to global sustainability. Negotiation of internationally recognized policies to govern commercial activities beyond Earth orbit, including the viable and sustainable utilization of space resources. The pursuit of new collaborative relationships, educational opportunities, capacity building and training programs, 
and assistance with the startup of commercial activities enabled through public-private partnerships, incubator programs, and international consortia. Progress toward implementing uh, the Gaelics will be measured by both the extent and long-term sustainability of public-private partnerships and multinational alliances launched to enable this initiative, as well as the number and diversity of space research institutions and educational organizations engaged in this enterprise. Efforts will also be made to identify opportunities for creative business development, new forms of cooperative space activities that will generate new wealth, helping to accelerate human exploration throughout the solar system, as well as enable the long-term viability of our species on planet Earth. Both near and long-term Gaelic goals and objectives will be developed by an international steering committee formed for this purpose over the coming months and will be designed to explore and promote new types of cooperative ventures and related financing, as well as innovative organizational models and international cooperative arrangements. Memoranda of understanding to promote public-private partnerships and multinational alliances will be drafted with key space organizations and institutions, NASA, ESA, the National Space Society, other space agencies and organizations, universities, private corporations, United Nations programs, and other space alliances. We also will be sponsoring webinars, beginning with our upcoming Galix International Webinar in March, that we envision will help launch both public, private, and international partnerships that will help expand and diversify humankind's exploration. Jim, yes. Were you going to be sharing your screen? It's not being shared? Oh, no, no. What? No. I was just wondering about that. Oh, Lord. Well, I uh, hit share screen. No, no. Uh, would you like me to do it instead? Oh, Wait. heavens. Well, I'm almost done with my presentation. Uh, okay. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, shoot. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. Well, uh, you want me to play from start and just quickly run uh, through the slides? Uh, if you want to just bring them up real quick and then get to the point where you are to, right now, that would be great. Or, or oh, we could okay. just go through. If you want to just go through and finish up the, the and well, we well, can... well, well, let's finish. But uh, okay, oh, let's shucks. do that. I nope. have no idea. I was just wondering. Uh, yes, sorry to interrupt. I should have done it sooner. Hmm. Where is the, okay, I'm looking for the share screen button. I, I hit the share screen button. Before. You have to hit it, you have to hit it a couple times. Oh, a couple of times. Yeah, you hit it once uh -huh. and then you'll, you'll hit, you'll see it on the far left. It'll say share screen and then you hit share. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now you've got it coming up. There he goes. And now we see your, now we see your, um, you see your desktop. Yep. So just Wait go to, a minute. okay. How do I get to the, uh, uh Let's go to your PowerPoint or. Oh, heavens, I'm sorry. That's OK. okay. Play from start. Can, can you see it now? Not yet. There okay. we go. Yep, you can you can scroll through and get to where you okay. are. Then. Okay. OK, so there's Space Enterprise embarking on the new era, the public private institutions and those opportunities, the Gaelic vision. I'm sorry, I wish I had known this wasn't being. Hmm. OK, the initial concept. Uh, and uh, relaunch as a global space alliance, um, the Gaelic strategy moving forward, uh, our operational focus and goals, um, and uh, measuring progress going forward in the next step. I think this is where you were. Yep, as I yeah. recall. Okay. Yeah. You can so, take it up uh, from here. Yep. Okay. So. Yeah, both, both near and long-term Gaelic goals and objectives will be developed by an international steering committee formed for this purpose over the coming months and will be designed to explore and promote new types of cooperative ventures and related financing, as well as innovative organizational models and innovative cooperative arrangements. Uh, memorandum of understanding to promote public-private partnerships and multinational alliances will be drafted with key space organizations and institutions, NASA, ESA, National Space Society, other space agencies and organizations, universities, private corporations, United Nations and other space alliances, 
And uh, we'll also be sponsoring webinars, beginning with our upcoming Galix International Webinar March, March that we envision will help launch both public-private and international partnerships that will help expand and diversify humankind's exploration and development of the cosmos. Um, we're currently seeking to promote uh, Galix's multiple goals and objectives through memorandum of understanding with affiliate Galix members, uh, public, and through public outreach seminars, training sessions, publications, and related YouTube presentations. Uh, it will be we'll be reaching out in coming days to a broad range of institutions and programs uh, to engage with this alliance, including space agencies and councils, space associations and societies like NSS, international space organizations and relevant United Nations offices and agencies, uh, universities and research institutes with space interests, space corporations, space related foundations and organizations and space media. So it's gonna be very inclusive. Uh, so our, our formal launch pad uh, for Galix will be our upcoming inaugural Congress in March. And we would certainly welcome engagement from any uh, interested members of the National Space Society to help advance the visions and goals uh, for Galix that we truly believe will make a difference in helping to advance humankind's exploration of and development in space. Mahalo. Very good, thanks, Jim. What we'll do is when we get to the Q&A, hey. we, can, we can always put the slides up again too to, to, uh, to highlight any points that people do have questions because I know one has come in already uh, so, and we'll make sure that we give everyone the, uh, the link to register for the inaugural Congress as well. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So what you can do now, Jim, if you could stop sharing. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. So everybody, I'm just going to put my camera back on and then so I can introduce uh, our next speaker, and I will share my screen again as well. Okay. And you do have to make sure you hit it twice. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Jim. We look forward to hearing more about that as we uh, get into the discussion and questions. And uh, I did put uh, I did put the website on here now to register for the Congress as well. And again, we'll put that into the chat so everybody can see that. So again, as it says, there's it's uh, it's free, uh, but first come, first serve. So make sure you uh, register as soon as you can. So now that you've heard a, a perspective about an alliance for uh, space settlement, let's talk about some concepts and. Our friend Jim Plaxico is now going to talk about a design competition he was part of called How to Design a Martian Civil you know, Civilization of One Million People Experiences from the Mars City State Design Competition. So, uh, Jim, I'm going to turn it all over to you. Thank you, Bert. And away we go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Plaxico, Chicago Society for Space Studies and a uh, National Space Society space ambassador. And I'm seeing something on my screen. It says, please move the window. I'm not sure where that is coming from. Hmm, are, are you seeing something strange on your screen or is it just me? No, I see it on mine. Please move this window away from the shared application. <laughs> Well, I guess we're just going to leave it there. I'm not sure what Zoom is up to here. Um, my story starts last year when the Mars Society uh, announced their Mars City State Design Competition. Uh, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I don't know what Zoom is up to. And I am going to go back and we'll start this again changing strategies here. I'm just going to share my whole desktop. And we'll start from scratch and maybe Zoom will like this better. Anyway, my, my story begins a year ago when the Mars Society announced their Mars City State Design Competition. 
And the inset in the upper right of the screen you know, identifies the four main judging areas by which they would evaluate uh, the submissions uh, that they received. Uh, and they ultimately did receive 175 submissions for this contest. I thought about entering, but I thought, whoa, this is way too much work for me. Uh, but then I got an email from the New Space Chicago group uh, saying that they were interested in sponsoring uh, a team for the competition. I said, yeah, count me in. And a few weeks later, uh, we actually had our first online meeting. And while it wasn't our first order of business, we did decide to call ourselves the Windy City Settlers. Now, given the complexity of the design, we decided to break the design problem down along the lines of the contest's grading system. And then we added a fifth team that would actually be the group of people responsible for writing the actual submission. And to use, uh, to coordinate our work and to get it done, we used a variety of online tools and the main ones I've got outlined here. Now, this is maybe my favorite image in this entire presentation. Uh, one thing we did pretty early in the project was to survey the team uh, about our feelings with respect to a number of issues that would impact our design. And I am confident that I'm the guy in the yellow circle over here based on what I know about my responses uh, to the questionnaire. Um, but more importantly, given the prominence of the societal uh, component of the design competition, uh, you can see that this range of responses indicates that we were far from unified in our ideas as to what a Martian civilization should actually be like, how it should be structured. Um, I use this graphic uh, to give you an idea of our approach to tackling the design problem. The empty jar represents the constraints imposed on us, namely the contest rules, the time frame, and the human resources that we had at our disposal. Uh, the jar of big rocks represents the major components of the system that we would be designing, the big ticket items. The jar of pebbles represents uh, key aspects uh, of those major blocks, uh, particularly connections and dependencies. And the jar full of sand is basically all of those details that within the framework of this contest were just too small for us to spend any time worrying about. And here I've outlined for you the contest top level requirements. Uh, we got a set of guidelines and a point system that was identified as to how submissions would be judged. Uh, two key numbers on this slide, the shipping costs for cargo from Earth to Mars and from Mars back to Earth. And I'll be revisiting these later. And approaching the design problem uh, from a top-down perspective, we went about identifying the major elements first, uh, and then the sources and sinks of resources and the various system interdependencies. Now, an early objective for us was to establish a time frame. What moment in history are we talking about in which we have a million people on Mars. Uh, and from then we could kind of get an idea of, okay, where are we talking about? Where will we be technologically by that point in time? Now, Elon Musk had talked about having a million people on Mars by 2050. And we were, I think, pretty much unanimous in our belief that that was just like way too optimistic. Uh, so the, here are the design parameters I used in creating a simulation for how long it would take us to have a population of 1 million people on Mars. 
And you will note this is only addressing passenger flights to Mars. No attempt was made to model how many cargo transport flights to Mars would be required. And uh, this chart here uh, shows you the cumulative number of passenger flights to Mars. And in our closing year 2127, when we've reached a million people, uh, of the 1 million people that would be on Mars, only about 20% of them would have been born on Mars. And that was using a, uh, a higher than US average birth rate. Uh, NASA Ames website, they've got a great little trajectory calculator that I used because I wanted to get some uh, idea uh, on the numbers of flights to Mars and the variances uh, of those flights. So this chart is a great way of illustrating the variance in the amount of energy required for any particular trip to Mars, uh, the variance and the amount of time it's gonna take you to go from Earth to Mars, and the fact that launch intervals come at discrete points in time. Now, related to the transportation question uh, is the amount of stuff that people consume. Now on the left, uh, I've got an interesting table here uh, that shows how much the average person consumes in terms of natural resources over the course of a year. And on the right uh, is a diagram uh, from a NASA document showing how much air, water, and food a person consumes uh, on average on a daily basis. Uh, in short, we use a lot of stuff. Now, recall that transportation cost assumption of $500 a kilogram. Uh, say you're on Mars and you're really craving a, a glass of milk. Well, while that gallon of milk you buy may cost $4 here on Earth, to ship it to Mars is going to cost you another $2,000. Uh, and even with the Mars Society's expectation that shipping costs from Mars back to Earth would only be $200 per kilogram, uh, I agree entirely with Elon that the idea of mining Mars for the export of resources to Earth just is not practical. Now, when the Mars Society gave their guidance on cargo costs, they gave, they, or excuse me, they remained silent on the question of how much it would cost to send a person to Mars. Now, Elon Musk had initially speculated that we could send people to Mars for maybe $200,000 a person. Uh, but he later raised that estimate to half a million dollars a person. Now it's a given that man-rated missions are far more expensive than unmanned missions. Uh, and the cost to ship a person to Mars is not just that person's weight, it's their weight plus the weight of all the resources that they're going to consume through the duration of that trip plus the added cost of the life support systems, and plus you're not gonna pack people into a rocket ship like you're gonna pack cargo. So I use some uh, this spreadsheet here to come up with a, a range of costs per kilogram, uh, comparing the cost of on a kilogram basis of sending a person to Mars versus sending freight to Mars. And if you assume that you have a perfectly efficient uh, ECLS system that 100% of your air is recycled, 100% of your water is recycled, and you have zero losses, and that the only thing consumed is food, you see that when you add all that together and break down the costs, uh, it paradoxically works out to being a cost that is lower per kilogram than the cargo cost for sending 
dead mass to Mars. So uh, I either these cargo numbers are wrong in terms of cost or the cost of a uh, cost assumption of $500,000 per person is wrong. Now, another decision we had to make is where on Mars are our centers of population and our centers of mining going to be located. And you can see from this physiographic map of Mars that Mars has actually got a lot of geological diversity. And that's a good thing because these different geological processes result in different concentrations of various minerals and elements, which makes them uh, better mining opportunities. So a driver for siting is the location of enriched deposits of those resources that would be mined to support our Martian civilization. Obviously the most valuable and versatile of these resources is going to be water. So cheap access to water is a priority. And this graphic shows the location of subsurface water ice uh, with the color uh, indicating how far below the surface that ice starts. Uh, in this particular paper, uh, the area that's in that white outlined rectangular space at the top uh, was identified as being the ideal location for accessing water ice. But just because there's water doesn't mean it won't be in short supply. Now, I love using Camp Century as an analogy for lunar and Martian bases. Camp Century was a nuclear powered city built under the Greenland ice sheet by the US Army. Now, even though these guys are surrounded by clean, fresh water in the form of snow and ice, water had to be rationed because the supply that they had just simply couldn't meet the demand. And that was because of the infrastructure that they had for harvesting that frozen water and converting it into liquid water. So siting is gonna be based on a set of factors. And for every one of these factors, there are going to be trade-offs. And this is the final uh, siting map uh, that identifies all of our population centers and our mining hubs. It also shows the layout of our transportation system. Uh, one problem I kind of have with this scenario is the presence of a global rail network, which I find hard to justify given a population of only 1 million people. But on the other hand, you do need connectivity, you know, and you are going to be using this transportation network primarily to transport raw materials. But still, a distributed system like this, given the population, represents a high cost per person solution. Now, there was an aesthetic design component to the contest. Uh, and it seemed that none of us on the team were really all that much interested uh, in it. So we didn't spend a lot of time and effort on that part. Uh, I do take exception to this guaranteed 35 hour uh, work week on the grounds that it's not really aesthetics uh, and it's probably not going to be practical either. Now, there was a lot of interest in designing the Martian government. I was not a member of that team, uh, but I was troubled by several aspects of the design uh, that was in our proposal. Um, I did have a problem with the fact that Mars would be ruled by a single world government and that no independent settlement of Mars would be allowed. I've also found myself scratching my head over the fact that there was a identified a need to have 20,000 judges in a system where there were no jails and there would be no imprisonment. In fact, the worst thing that could happen to you was if your crime was really bad, you would be ostracized. 
but only after a popular vote had been held uh, to decide whether or not you should be ostracized. Uh, another issue I had with uh, this part of the design was initially the team was calling for the population of Mars to be an exact proportional replica of the population of Earth. Uh, I argue that this was not at all realistic on three grounds. One, if you look at the fraction of the Martian population that has uh, bachelor, master, doctorate degrees, underdeveloped countries simply don't have the same proportion of graduates in their population. Two, in order to come to Mars by their own definition, uh, you had to have a job offer. Again, I doubt that underdeveloped countries are going to be getting job offers at the same rate as OECD economies. And three, a person is expected to pay for their passage to Mars, which was optimistically set at half a million dollars a person. Uh, again, a simple glance uh, at per capita income by nation shows that some nations just are going to be really challenged by that. So fortunately, uh, the folks uh, on the design did make some adjustments to address some of that, but, you know, they didn't go far enough to satisfy uh, myself. Um, there was also a great deal of interest working uh, in working on the technical design, which I think makes sense given, you know, that's why we were all there. We're all fans of this stuff. Um, this was the most challenging part of the design due to its complexity, the interdependencies, as well as the need to coordinate with the economics team and to make sure that we're all on the same page with identifying critical goods and services and identifying our export markets. Now, one aspect of the technical design was figuring out what it would take to feed our million people. Now, in creating a simulation, uh, I wanted to make sure that the parameters for the solution space erred on the side of caution. And in designing my simulation uh, for the agricultural production, I was particularly indebted to this analysis of the Mars One mission. And it makes for really excellent reading if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, and if I recall, there was a, a YouTube video that had Bass Lansdorp, the guy behind Mars One, debating uh, a couple of the members of this MIT team uh, who participated in this analysis. And that debate only strengthened my confidence uh, in the quality of the analysis they did and their conclusion that everybody was going to die. <laughs> so, um, another key design criteria is uh, identifying water consumption because you're going to have to allocate resources to the mining of water, storage of water, transportation of water. Um, so now the analysis I did was only for agricultural and personal water use. I made no attempt to model industrial use. And note that the numbers I give here are purely demand-based. In other words, flow. So I'm not saying that we need, you know, X liters of new water today merely that we have to support a system that can deliver this many liters of water per day. And of course, that ties in with energy consumption. So for my part, the energy consumption I modeled was for personal use and agricultural use. No attempt was made to estimate uh, how much energy would be required for uh, industrial use. So if you read our report, you will find minimal information about our technical design. Uh, and this diagram from our submission provides the only graphical overview uh, of the technical design. And if I was a contest judge, I don't know that I would have given us a very good grade. Uh, 
even though we did a lot of good work behind the scenes. Um, but our, the first draft we had of our report was 45 pages, and we had to cut over half of that out to get down to 20 pages. So uh, a lot of the work we did wound up on the cutting room floor. Uh, I found our economic design uh, to be the biggest negative of our submission. Again, I was on the technical team and a member of the economic team, uh, but ultimately, you know, all this came down to the folks who were on the report writing team, who I will, I will give them two thumbs up for producing a totally professional appearing report. Uh, I could have never come close to doing the job that these folks did. Um, but I took serious exception to a number of the positions uh, with respect to the economic system that were taken in our design. Now, I did have one area of contention with the Mars Society and their contest design. And that was their expectation that the only people we would be able to export to would be back on earth. I just found it hard to swallow that we would have a million people on Mars, but no one on the moon, no one living in space colonies, no one living uh, at asteroid outposts or space stations or anywhere else. So I had argued that our export economy should focus not on exporting back to Earth, but on exporting to other space-based economies because Mars would actually have a competitive advantage over the Earth when it comes to those particular markets. And one source of income uh, that's been talked about for Mars uh, that I actively discouraged was that of space tourism. Given the number of trip opportunities, the transit time round trip, uh, and the fixed and lengthy stay times, I really don't see Mars as being able to really benefit from a space tourism economy. So you wanna start a business on Mars? Well, here I've adapted Porter's model of competitive advantage to our Martian economy. And the one factor that's present in each of these competitive advantage categories is that of governance. Now, here's a version of my original product matrix uh, that was updated to reflect decisions as to governments, excuse me, governance. Uh, if you take a look at the products being produced, the bulk of them are being created by government-owned monopolies. And half of the goods that are allowed to be produced by privately-owned competitive businesses are trivial. Uh, it, when you think about it, artwork, entertainment, selling rocks and water back to earth. So I would say that this is completely at odds with the concept of producing a submission that is designed to attract businesses and capital investment to Mars. Now, one thing there's universal agreement on, and that is the importance of secure private property rights as a precondition for economic development. Uh, in fact, this is a frequent area of discussion today with respect to the Outer Space Treaty and the abolition of private property rights in the Moon Treaty was central to its failure to get ratified. So I feel that the lack of respect for private property rights in our submission is really uh, an economic death blow uh, to our Martian economy. And I'll give you a, for example, let's say you want to build a lunar or excuse me, a Martian rover repair garage. So you have to get the government's permission to build that. You have to turn over 10% of your business to the Martian government, they have to um, approve your business plans. And this assumes that you are able in an open, 
competitive bidding system uh, that you're able to procure a lease on a tract of land for a given term of time that was meant to be a short term. Now, at the end of that term, the lease goes back up on the open market again, and anybody can now bid on the land on which you have cited your business. So if I'm a competing business and I buy your lease, you are out of business. Not only that, but you're required to return the land to its original state. So I would argue that no one uh, is going to invest uh, in a business in this type of environment. And there are a number of uh, other factors uh, that serve as substantial disincentives uh, to the economic development of Mars. Uh, there is a lot going on that is going to be anti-innovation. And that's something uh, innovation is that the Martian economy is truly going to need. Um, so I really don't have anything good to say about our plan. Uh, I have a lot of bad things, obviously, uh, to say about our plan. And if anybody is interested in this kind of stuff, uh, I suggest you can uh, read uh, an annual publication of the World Bank called Doing Business. Uh, it's got a lot of fascinating information in there. Now, the one thing that could throw a monkey wrench into all of this and for which we did not control was the role of automation. Maybe a hundred years from now, none of us will have to work because AI and robotics will be so advanced that you know we are expendable as far as uh, labor is concerned. So that could totally turn all of this on its head, but that's pretty speculative. We tried to stay grounded in uh, the real world experiences uh, that we have in place today. And this was the cover of our design submission. Uh, as I say, I thought we submitted a really beautifully designed uh, report for the contest. And so I'm very proud of the work uh, that the report writers did because I certainly could have never done it. And that concludes uh, my very brief presentation on uh, my experiences as a member of a team that had entered the Mars Society's Mars City State Design Competition. So Bert, I'm going to con turn control back over to you. Very good. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm just going to start my video again so we can get into some questions. And uh, I did see one question that would apply to both of you. Uh, would your slides be available to be distributed? Uh, you know, so I just want to see if, because uh, we certainly can do that when we send out the link for the recording. And, uh, you know, some of it might be private, you know, Jim, especially with, you know, with uh, some of your contest information. I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh. The slides aren't available, but I am. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I, and you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to say Jim C and Jim P. How's that? So I, instead, of, instead of Jim 1 and Jim 2. So Jim C, okay to send your slides out? Sure. Okay. Great. Great. So let me, st let me start with you, Jim C, uh, with a quick question. You know, I, I saw your biography and you've been involved in the creation of a lot of different organizations, space related organizations related to even government. How did you go about creating this global alliance? Uh, you know, what, what are the steps you take when you're trying to, especially, you know, it might be say, oh, I'm, I'm creating something that just brings people together, but you're talking about governments, non-governmental agencies, associations. How do you go about starting something like that? Well, you look, <clears throat> you look for the bottom line. What do all of these ag agencies, organizations, uh, individuals that are pioneers have in common? What are they reaching for? And when you find that common substrate, then you build on that because the whole idea of the public-private partnerships and the international alliances, there's gotta be a common ground there somewhere in order to bring all the people together. So through the years, I've been listening to what people assess as priorities for space exploration and development. 
and also some of the challenges in terms of why haven't we done this more since the Apollo program? I mean, it's been half a century. And I mean, Buzz Aldrin is on our team. And uh, <laughs> half a century ago, he walked on the moon. Well, um, why haven't we been back since? And where are the priorities of humankind sort of swayed back and forth? And where has space entered into all the priorities that nations link? And what we're looking, I like to use the uh, analogy of a Petri dish, a very rich agar that you dump things into and some amazing creatures crawl out of it. And you have to find sort of a, a common substrate that is of interest to uh, public folks, private folks, internationally. I mean, how can space exploration and development really turn some pages that can be maximally beneficial to all of humankind? And so the idea of this global alliance for space exploration and development, we're looking for commonalities in terms of vision, in terms of need, in terms of priorities, and how can we make it all match? And in so doing, emphasize the collaboration rather than the competition in bringing people together. That's so important because right now we're battering heads all over the planet on this. Yeah, I was, I was, I, I was actually going to ask anyway. you about that. What's the state of the of global alliance now or global collaboration? Now, you know, so you, you well, kind of played into it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's why we're holding the Congress next month. We want to bring together various perspectives on why go to space and how can competing or collaborating rather than competing get us there sooner and uh, more cost effectively and with uh, greater outcomes in terms of the positive benefits and from a scientific perspective, but also from a social development perspective and, you know, trying to bring humanity together under a common theme. There's so much conflict globally right now. And if we, if we focus on sort of a, a common set of objectives, uh, maybe the rainbow we're heading for uh, would be uh, appreciated and enjoyed and benefited by all the participants. So we're looking for that common baseline, you know, how we can find common interests, uh, common priorities, and ultimately demonstrate that it will be mutually beneficial to all participants through the collaboration rather than competition, reducing the costs, enhancing the benefits, and hopefully accelerating timetables for future space missions. Very good. Let me get a couple more before I transition to Jim P. Uh, Ari asks about where can they learn more about this project? I did post the, the, the link for the registration. Is that a place for people to go to get more information? Yeah, well, we're actually developing a website right now. We'll send you the link as soon as that's, that's completed. But uh, there'll be ways to just patch in and find out where we're at with the negotiations. But a lot of this will, will roll out of the Congress we're holding next month. So uh, before we get too detailed in terms of what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, with whom, by when, all those details will be worked out at the Congress. And then we'll post that and then start reaching out again, as we did last year, to UN COPUS, other international organizations, uh, bring in the private sector folks. Uh, and, uh, and of course, NASA big time, the space portal has been very supportive of what we're doing, but we're talking to Bernard Foing and ESA and other folks uh, internationally that I think collectively share this vision that, yeah, we, what we're proposing makes sense, but what's the best way to do it cost effectively that's gonna to relate to bottom lines all over the planet that you know, will, will resonate. And using that website right now is that, that we posted, is that the best place to go right now if they register? Yeah, yeah, for, for, okay. for right now, but yeah. And, okay. and, and I'll send you updates as we move Oh, forward. very good. And we can let everyone know that. Fabulous. Sure. So let me make a, a transition. Now that we talked a little bit about uh, alliances, let me make a transition to Jim P with the design competition. First, Jim, how many hours did your team put into this? You know, the, your report is so extensive and the things you covered, I'm in awe. So, so I, you know, you did this as, you know, as a, as a volunteer team, obviously, but wow, how much time was involved? <laughs> you know, now I'm really sorry you asked that because I have to admit that I was stupid to not remember to get that number because we did do an estimate of how much time we spent between meetings, 
uh, of representatives. Uh, and because in addition to having our regular sub team meetings, then we also had a weekly representatives from each of the sub teams meeting so that we could keep each other appraised of what was going on. But we put in a lot of hours. Uh, and somewhere I've got it written down. <laughs> Uh, but it, it was a lot of work, but it was a, I think it was a great learning experience uh, for everyone involved. At least that was true for me. Um, so, you know, yeah, that's, it was a lot, it was right. a lot of work, but it was, uh, even though we didn't win, I think it was well worth it, uh, you know, uh, the time that was spent on it. How did you assemble the team, all the different technical aspects, the economic expertise? Because obviously you need more, you needed more than the technical on this. Yeah, well, there was kind of like a pre-conversation with people uh, to see, well, you know, is this somebody who uh, the team would benefit from having on the team? But then once we got into our full up meetings and started discussing our areas of interest. Uh, we actually, uh, and I've got a degree in economics. Uh, so that signals my interest uh, in economic issues. Uh, we had another person who was an economics uh, professor at a university. We had some other folks who were interested in it uh, from the business community. Uh, I would say that on the technical team is probably where we were actually the weakest. If you look at it from the perspective of resumes, we had people, you know, with engineering knowledge, business knowledge, but we didn't have anyone who like had worked for NASA designing, you know, life support systems. Um, but, you know, we weren't getting down to that level of detail. Again, we had to keep this uh, at a fairly high level going down just far enough that our work was internally uh, self-consistent, that we weren't doing things that were inconsistent with one another from that technical aspect. And like I say, unfortunately, the bulk Hardly any of that work actually made it into uh, the report, but something I left out of this presentation was the whole thing about the decision that was made to structure our report along the lines of the New York area Amazon H2Q proposal solicitation. Now, at the time, we all, myself included, were very enthusiastic that, yeah, this is a great idea. But now in hindsight, um, I wonder a little bit, was like, you know, maybe within the framework of what the Mars Society was looking for, this wasn't the best way to approach it because it takes on more of a marketing appeal and I'm wondering if the folks at Mars Society, the judges were looking for something that had more of a technical orientation. Very good. Let me see, got a couple other, there was a chat question that was, did any of your team uh, play that terraf, there's a terraf, a Mars terraforming game. And someone was asking if any of the team members used that. Um, not as a team. I recall that one person mentioned something about a Mars terraforming game because I think I went and checked it out because it piqued my curiosity. Uh, but in the end, no, you know, there was uh, search engines was our, you know, primary right. tool for information collection. Very good. Let me get a couple of other questions that came in, and then I want to go back to Jim C. Uh, John asks, any use of lunar manufacturing launched from L points? We did not. Uh, actually, the word lunar never appeared in anything uh, of the contest guidelines. And again, that was, uh, as I mentioned, a kind of a sore point with me to think that, you know, our only trading partner would be Earth. 
uh, or that Mars's only trading partner would be Earth. So we were, uh, our, at least for my part, focused on, let's say, a triway type of trade so that maybe the moon could offer product, certain pro classes of products to Earth more cheaply, but then we could offer stuff to the moon more cheaply than the Earth. And then uh, for our imports, we wouldn't have to rely solely on the Earth, but maybe uh, there would be cheaper alternatives, particularly with respect to asteroid mining. Uh, asteroid mining for the Earth does not make sense, but it does make sense, I think, for people living on Mars, given that you're starting with no infrastructure in place uh, and that we don't know that the concentrations of relevant elements and metals are of a sufficiently high grade to make it them economic to mine. Um, and given the transportation cost differential, it seemed to me that we, Mars could well be more reliant on um, the asteroids for raw materials, but given the size and scope of Earth's advanced industrial base, the only thing we would want to import from Earth would be those items that we simply could not manufacture on Mars because we lack the infrastructure and the skills. Very good. Let me make a transition, not to a technical question, but you raised the issue of ostracism. And the, the question is from Rodney, ostracism in ancient Athens meant that the person was exiled from Athens for 10 years. Do they mean the same thing when you meant ostracism? Does ostracism mean send them back to Earth? <laughs> uh, given that that would cost ha a half a million dollars, uh, I don't know. Maybe it meant showing them the airlock and escorting them out the building. Uh, that, you know, I was not on the political team. And so I don't know what discussions they had. I did not see anywhere uh, any in any of the online documentation that we were using and referencing, uh, that ostracism was actually defined. Okay. So sorry, I, that's the best answer I can say is it's outside my scope of awareness is what the actual meaning was as it was used in our submission. Right. That's a great transition to, to Jim C. Jim, you've, you've heard and saw Jim's presentation, and obviously a lot of issues were raised, economic, technical, political. Uh, when you see that type, when, they, when you see that kind of thought that goes into a game, how do you take that and think about it in, in real life when you're thinking about an alliance and the issues that you're going to face for space settlement. You know, this might, you know, I, I always think this are, these are the things you're going to be discussing uh, as an organization. Yeah, and I think it's, we want to be as inclusive as possible. So it's most important to bring in people into the discussion from various walks of life. Yes, clearly scientists and engineers and, and space entrepreneurs will be a big part of this. But we also want to get other dimensions in terms of What's it going to mean for humankind and from, from many perspectives, uh, social organization, health, uh, there's a whole rainbow of, of impacts here that uh, space exploration and development will have. And the bottom line in all of this, I mean, something that's really driving me and my interest in this is ways to help bring humankind together. Uh, there's a lot of um, antipathy out there right now around the planet people logging heads from a political standpoint, from economic standpoints. Um, and, but there's, there's a commonality in all of us being humans. There are things that really we all can relate to as human beings. Can we define what those are? And can we connect our survival on this planet and our interrelationships with what's out there? And um, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said in terms of improving human relationships and the kinds of not just 
how we relate to each other, but our organizational structures. And uh, as we're setting sort of a template for the future of humankind and its potential survivability, you know, on this planet, yes, we have global climate change and warming and all those things to worry about, but also from the political and social and economic standpoints, there are really points of tension and disparities around the planet that need to be rectified. And one way of doing that is to find a sort of a common agenda to bring people together, to reach out for, toward common goals that are of mutual interest. And space brings a lot of that down to earth, so to speak, <laughs> because there are, there are things we have to consider globally or to prevent climate change and climate warming and uh, depreciation of various resources worldwide and uh, human health and uh, some of the pandemic that we're experiencing right now. I mean, we need to collaborate. So we're trying to find sort of an, again, an undercurrent that really brings people together and develops those public-private partnerships and the international alliances, which really will make a difference for all humankind. Very good. In a nutshell. Yep. <laughs> One question that I think I'd like to, to toss at both of you uh, comes from Don and, and I'll start with you, Jim P. You know, this seems like a very regimented plan. What about the idea of a Wild West type of immigration to build a territory that will then be governed once a basic economy society is formed? So I mean, that's probably might be a little out of the scope of what their game was, but an interesting question. Well, in terms of our design, that was why one of the very early slides I showed was where we fall as a team. And you think about it, all of us had a lot in common, uh, not to mention the fact that we all wanted to design a Martian <clears throat> civilization. So I would say that we came from a fairly narrow segment of society uh, in terms of having a lot of things in common, but you could still see we were all over the map in terms of our expectation. Uh, and one of those, I was at the extreme end of saying that anybody who can come to Mars, you know, why let's let them come. If they, could, if they can pay for the trip to get there and, you know, they're skilled, let them in. But other people wanted it to be a very, you know, set a very high bar uh, for admission. And that was also why I was dismayed by the fact that this decision was that there would be no independent settlements allowed, which means if you don't like the way your settlement is being governed, too bad. You're stuck with it. You've got nowhere else on Mars that you can go, no alternatives. Um, so, and that's something that is really going to depend on how does settlement of Mars actually evolve? Because, you know, with the contest, it was a kind of assumed that, okay, you've already got a million people on Mars. You've already addressed all these things. So we were kind of leapfrogging all those hard decisions that have to be made before you ever get to that point. And so I think what we ultimately see is really going to be driven uh, by the pathway or pathways by which we come to establish a, a permanent human presence on Mars. Jim C., any thoughts on that same question? Well, the exploration and development of space is something that is more doable in some societies than others. But I think the, the theme of what's out there and uh, how do we relate to the cosmos is, is fairly universal. And you find it in uh, back doors of Hindustani proverbs and uh, Russian uh, pronouncements. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a global enterprise that uh, really relates to all of us as humans. But of course, there are tremendous variations in terms of what various societies and, and cultures and organizations can do to interact. But again, trying to find that common interest in space exploration and development, what it means to various cultures and the likely impacts it will have on future human development, both in terms of humans evolving as a species and humans being able to get along together you know, in their current status, uh, it's, it's, it's very significant. And it's something that we all should 
want to consider and toss around in our heads, have more dialogue. It's the whole point of having the webinar next month and, and beyond for Galix to try and figure out where all the points of commonality might come together to build a more uh, viable future for hum humankind on this planet and beyond. Very good. I, I love this discussion. I know we're running up on time right now. Let me see if I can get one or two more questions in. So I do apologize, everybody who submitted questions if we missed any. Uh, just a quick one. I think, Jim, you can answer quickly. This comes from Wes. Uh, are there competing Mars City design programs? Because Googling the term produces uh, MarsCityDesign.com as well as MarsSociety.org. Are you aware of it? Uh, there are, there's even, the Moon Society's got a moon uh, base uh, colony design contest. So there are multiple Mars civilization, what call it what you will, design contests. In fact, this is the second such contest for the Mars Society. Their first one was their Mars colony design contest. There has been at least one contest where the focus was on specifically on the architecture. You know, what? how are you going to build uh, in terms of what does it look like, your buildings on Mars? What will Martian architecture looks like, look like? Uh, so there have been a number of such contests. And I will say that the Mars Society, they did publish a book. Uh, I believe it contains the 20 top submissions to their Mars colony design contest. And the plan is they're going to do the same for the Mars city state design contest. And I look forward to that because I would very much like to see how other teams approached this very same challenge. Just how much uh, difference is there uh, in terms of the plans that we all came up with? Very good. Uh, let me close out one, qu one last question to each of you. Uh, Jim C., in terms of your event coming up uh, next month, what do you hope to be accomplished there? What's your you know, if you're saying this was a success, what will success look like coming out of that conference? We're trying to find uh, threads to weave a common theme for the future of humankind moving forward and understand how that commonality of interest in space can bridge many of the differences that we have economically, socially, politically, uh, worldwide and bring humankind closer together in exploring the various dimensions of space and figuring out what the future of our, of our species might and could be. Very good. Well, I hope to be able to attend that. And I encourage uh, some of our, our participants to do the same. It looks very interesting. Uh, Jim P., what do you think was learned from all this in terms of the competition overall? Because I saw that the Mars Society was actually going to publish uh, the like the top five, I think it was, or something like that. But is there was, is there a true lesson learned from all this? Uh, the problem is, I believe every team is going to be, you know, learning a different uh, suite of lessons, uh, you know, based on the particular dynamics of their team. But I would think that the key lesson is it's not going to be easy because there are just so many parameters. And I would really encourage people to check out that MIT analysis uh, of what was a fairly small and simple Mars One uh, co small colony on Mars, just to give yourself uh, an idea of how intimately related all these components are and how a misstep in one area can have catastrophic consequences in another area. Very good. Well, thank you both. I, I did want to mention one of the comments that came in in the chat. I like it. To, is there going to be room for a retirement colony there as well? <laughs> Thanks, Ray, believe, for that. It, believe it or not, that was something we did talk about. Very good. Very good. Well, 
thank you both. Thank you, Jim C. Thank you, Jim P. Uh, it was a very fascinating uh, the presentation, discussion. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. So we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. And uh, we hope maybe uh, come back for some more discussion, if that sounds good to both of you. Very good. That's good. Thank you, Bert. Great. Great. So everybody, what I want to do now, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and I will just be closing out this evening. And let me let me do that right now. A few very quick announcements. Uh, as we close out. So uh, again, I just want to thank uh, our speakers tonight. And also, of course, always thanking Larry Ahern, our VP of Chapters, who helps organize all these events, and Fred Becker, uh, who handles all the technical, and also uh, now our, our Dave Dressler, uh, who is also going to be handling some of the technical things. So thank you all for making these events so successful. So I wanted to remind everybody, we've got some upcoming events. What's coming up next time in two weeks is a conversation with the president. So this is confirmed. This is a town hall. Uh, just to remind you the difference between a space forum and a town hall, the space forum is where we talk about space issues, space settlement, technology, the future. Uh, the town halls are internal to the National Space Society, talking, uh, introducing you to the leadership, talking about issues and benefits related to NSS. So this one is we're bringing together three presidents. Uh, we've got uh, Jeff Notkin, our current president of the National Space Society. We have Michelle Hanlon, who is our president nominee, and Janet Ivey, who's also a member of the NSS Board of Governors, but also president of Explore Mars. And they're gonna be in a conversation and Rod Pyle, our editor from Ad Astra, is going to be doing the moderating. So we look forward to that. We do have another event coming up on the 25th, and we'll let you know about the details of that next time. Finally, as we close out, I just invite everyone to visit our space.nss.org, our website. If you are a member, encouraging you to go to inside.nss.org. And I actually posted it in the chat our YouTube site. We are starting to get all of our recordings of these presentations, space forums, town halls, onto the National Space Society YouTube site. So you can start taking a look at them. We'll be adding more as we go along, uh, as we get all the issues taken out. So feel free to check those out and check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and finally, again, I also posted this in uh, the chat. We really appreciate your support being members. And if you can, if you really enjoy these things and support our cause, feel free to make a, a donation. And that has also been in, the, I, as I said, I posted that link in the chat. So closing out, I wanna thank everyone, our panelists again, uh, wishing everyone a great evening, a, a great day if you're into tomorrow and a great weekend. We really appreciate your attendance and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks uh, for the town hall. So good night, everybody.